Hello. Welcome to the FX Big Picture podcast. This is a series of podcasts where we will discuss a wide variety of topics and provide a rather different perspective from our experiences serving UK customers at NatWest. My name is Duncan McCabe from the UK, F- UK corporate FX sales team. Today we have James Newman from the Financial Institutions FX sales team. And once again, we are joined by Neil Parker, our FX markets strategist. Today's topic is on central bank intervention in foreign exchange markets and why it seems to be of diminishing, in, a diminishing prominence in recent years. So starting with you, Neil, what exactly in layman's terms is central bank intervention in foreign exchange markets? Okay, so central bank intervention usually is either adding to or reducing the stockpile of foreign exchange reserves that they hold. And the reason that it's done is to either attempt to increase or reduce the value of your currency against a, a, a different currencies. But traditionally, it's been against the, 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 the US dollar or it's been, the, the interventions have been done sort of sterling against the dollar, euro against the dollar, Deutschmark against the dollar before the euro was in, in existence, Japanese yen uh, against the dollar. Those tended to be the interventions that we we were seeing. And, and uh, you, you mentioned, you know, why, why has it been done? It, it's predominantly been done in periods of significant uh, volatility in markets. So it's a, an attempt to try and either prevent further erratic movements in currencies um, or to smooth uh, markets to, to prevent those big moves occurring over a short space of time. When uh, So, so it's, it, it might be in an attempt to allow um, levels of liquidity to catch up um, with the, the, the sort of big market moves. Okay, almost to, to fill to fill the the gap risk, so to speak, and to sort of catch catch the falling knife a little earlier. If, so, if uh, is that is that is that is that what you mean by filling liquidity, or is I that mean, am I missing? That can, mark? No, that can be one reason for it. it you, you're absolutely right. I mean, there, there can be periods where that there, there, there is just a sudden. Um, disappearance of liquidity in the market and so the central bank might step in to, to try and fill that void uh, but that is only one reason why why it would be being done i mean ultimately you you have in the past and i say this for the benefit of sort of 25 26 years experience tended to see central bank intervention predominantly when a currency is um is too strong to trying to weaken it um, which actually usually is is an easier process to achieve versus trying to strengthen the currency or stabilize the currency. Now, you have seen specific, very um, noteworthy examples of that, but they tend to be less successful. Interesting. And, and going back to your, your layman's example, um, where a central bank will use their reserves to, to be able to achieve this, it doesn't suggest that this is a, an infinite capacity tool that is at the central bank's disposal no it's not i mean most central banks hold relatively small amounts of foreign currency reserves relative to the size of average daily turnover in the foreign exchange markets Um, but you would not expect a central bank to hold a sizable buffer of foreign exchange reserves because you wouldn't expect your currency to come under speculative attack particularly regularly and it's only one element of the toolbox that they have obviously they have other things that they can utilize they can raise or lower interest rates as an example um you know that would be another element that they could deploy in trying to stabilize markets or to uh, to weaken or strengthen the currency so we've had some thinking back and i'm thinking about managed currencies and the you know through history there have been uh, you mentioned specific currencies but when are the when when are the what are the big um, historical um, or moments in time where, where which are noteworthy where currencies have become managed or or a relationship has ceased to be or where a currency has ceased to be managed. 
I, I mean, the most obvious and most recent one was the Swiss National Bank. Um, now, this wasn't where they were actually using their FX reserves. What they were doing instead is that they were uh, uh, they were accumulating additional FX reserves, but they'd actually pegged the uh, Swiss franc to the euro at a level of 1.2. Um, and it became increasingly painful for the Swiss National Bank to maintain that peg. Um, now, we've referred to this on previous podcasts, actually, that the way in which they implemented the change was was poor. Um, and consequently, it led to exactly what they didn't want, which was the absence of liquidity in foreign exchange markets. Um, so they withdrew the peg, but they had uh, what they thought up their sleep was a trump card because what they were going to do is that they were, they were going to... Um, or they reduced interest rates. So, that, that, so they basically tried to make um, holding Swiss francs punitive because you were being hurt with the interest rate that they were yielding in negative terms, negative 0.75%. That wasn't sufficient uh, penalty in order to prevent a significant and serious appreciation of the Swiss franc over a very short space of time because there was no liquidity. So that that's one what one. Uh, particular example of failure. You could go and look at the at the ERM crisis cross crises in ninety two and ninety three as another example. James, you, do you want to jump in at, uh, at this point? Yeah, I, th- I think um, the, the Swiss National Bank example is an incredibly pertinent one, just because um, post this, I think most younger listeners would will, will not think of um, FX intervention as a tool of central banks. It used to be a lot more prevalent um, in years gone by. And I think that the Swiss National Bank example, uh, for me, broke a lot of trust in that central bank in particular, and also central bankers having literally to the day before saying that they were not going to let that specific level go. And I, I think this for me, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, feeds into the, the question of the independent central bank and, and their policy tools and how that relates to fiscal policy. Um, I personally feel that arguably empirically in years to come, the exercise of an independent central bank being optical might be seen as a failed one, where if you look at the current crisis and previous crises, um, fiscal mon- and monetary policy have have interacted independently of each other and have been able to diverge and not work together when they maybe should have been. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting point, actually, James, because I think the reason why central banks were made independent in the first place was a lack of trust in government. Um, so the government w- w- was always at risk of sort of tinkering along the routes of, of of trying to get the central bank to commit the the monetary policy uh, element of, um, of of any economy uh, to the cause of stronger growth at the expense of inflation control and uh, and all of those sorts of things. Um, so I, I mean I, I'm not as pessimistic in terms of, of seeing the independent central bank as a failed sort of experiment. But, but I, I do think that there was a, that, that there was a, a much stronger reason going back into the 80s and 90s for making central banks independent in order to get, gain that credibility over inflation control. Um, the, the only I think, question now with regard to, uh, going back to your point about trust and the, and the Swiss National Bank, is do we trust central banks enough to remove some of that independence and 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 that uh, and still trust them to um, to target inflation so that so that we're not allowing inflation to get out of control um, and equally if inflation were to get out of control or if if other elements of the economy were to be acting suboptimally what would the central bank then do? How would that manifest itself onto foreign exchange markets? Would that then bring about the reintroduction of intervention in foreign exchange markets from central banks? You know, so they're, they're, all of these things are interlinked. I, I don't think that we're ever going to get back to a place where government exercises any significant control over central banks because I think it's too baked in now, even though we're only talking really about sort of in the UK's case, less than 25 years since the central bank was made operationally independent. And that's the other point to note. They're not fully independent. They still follow guidelines that are set for them by government. Um, 
Uh, so, you know, that's that, that's in the UK's case. For the European Central Bank, they are independent. But remember, they're made up of a lot of competing forces amongst central banks around Europe. Um, so I do think that, that, you know, looking at central banks and, and whether they will remain independent or not, I think they kind of have to be because to move away from that would deal a blow in credibility terms and their credibility in any in any case because of events like the uh, the SMB's uh, uh, removal of the the, the 120 peg um, I think that their credibility is still under question by markets yeah thanks uh, on the, on that credibility piece it's, um and thinking about the FX intervention as a as a policy tool or um, or as a or as an instrument to be able to to, to achieve what a uh, central bank wants to, to do is well, how, how effective is you know, central bank talk and rhetoric um, versus actually just outright spot market activity? You know, there, I'm sure that there's, there's, there's instances where central bank, well, there are, there are instances where a central banker will come out uh, and make a statement and the market will react. And then there'll be other times when it will take no notice. Talk is cheaper. Talk is cheaper rather than having yeah. to purchase or sell reserves. And um, clearly examples in the past have not been necessarily profitable or um, effective. Um, it, it seems that nowadays central bank policy in terms of FX intervention seems to follow a, a defined route of imply it, talk about it, get more people to talk about it, and then at a last resort, potentially intervene. I, I mean, and I, I'd also state that, that you think about how they're doing this with interest rates as well now. So they only have to hint that, that their policy might be changing or give some broad um, uh, macroeconomic variables that you need to watch. And Greenspan was a master of this. Um, going back to the, the, the previous decade, uh, sorry, not the previous decade, the decade before that, um, where he just sort of mentioned in passing some spurious measure uh, on the labour market that nobody had been watching previously. And then all of a sudden, that is the most important indicator that we need to be watching to see whether or not the Federal Reserve are going to change policy direction. Uh, and so, so I, I'd agree, James, it, it, absolutely talk is cheap. Uh, the fact of the matter is, though, talk doesn't work as well as it used to. I mean, I, again, I, go, going back to when I had hair and, um, you know, when I could stay up beyond 9.30 at night without yawning, um, back to 95 when I started in the markets, we had a guy called Mr. Yen, Sakaki um, and he was brilliant. I mean, he could talk the yen up or down or sideways. Um, uh, he could make markets move in the way that he wanted them to. And they didn't really need to, to reinforce that with a lot of intervention. They did give the markets a bit of a shove every now and again um, because the markets weren't, weren't, mm -hmm. weren't perhaps listening as, as they should have been. But predominantly when he talked, everybody waited for, for, uh, for, for him to say what he had to say and the market would move. That doesn't happen nowadays. It doesn't happen nowadays because I'll, I'll, I'll take you back to the ERM crisis. Um, of, of, of 92 and 93. The reason it doesn't happen is because markets know there are finite resources and people sort of give all of the credit to George Soros for the, 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 the UK's exit from the ERM. Um, but actually, the fact of the matter was, going back to James's point about credibility, the, the, the UK had no credibility in terms of remaining within the exchange rate mechanism. Everybody knew that when the central bank came in and bought sterling and sold dollars or Deutschmarks or whatever else they were selling, that that would only happen for a short period of time. And then they could just load up again and just hammer it lower. Yes, James. So, so we've, we've talked a lot about um, kind of central bank intervention when it's a bit more kind of big bang defined. W what about the kind of, smoother policies so for example in in a number of kind of asian currencies there's there's a bit more kind of managed exchange rates around certain parameters um for example the renminbi being one of them which trades on a, on a basket basis um how does that kind of factor into our thoughts on central bank intervention 
I, I mean, I think that's more likely to, to work. It's more likely to work because you're not looking for a big shift, a big direction change. You're just, again, perhaps trying to replace some uh, of the uh, uh, lack of liquidity in markets. You might be trying to sort of um, uh, just sort of smooth out moves more than, the, the, than actually change direction. So, so slow the whole process down. I don't know. I mean, like, I, I I think over time, it would. Be, if you were doing it for any uh, specific length of time, a week, a month, a quarter, it probably wouldn't work. But if you're only doing it over a day or two, it probably does. Um, and provided that your interventions are unexpected, provided that the markets aren't waiting for them, um, I think it's got more of a chance to work. But it does depend on where on, on where you're intervening. For uh, and again, another example here is that you know that um, when there is activity in certain emerging markets, and I'm thinking here particularly of Turkey, um, you know that's going to have a big effect in terms of the way in which the currency is going to trade. That boils down again to lower levels of overall liquidity. Um, but you know it's it's going to have an effect. It makes it harder to uh, um, to hold back the tide, um, uh, rather than you know if you were to see uh, and I and I highly doubt that you'd ever see it. But if you were to see intervention in euro dollar, you know what size are we talking about before it even scratches the surface? You know, how many billions, tens of billions or hundreds of billions are you going to have to, to expend to, to, to even start to, uh, to, to, to turn the tide here, given the size of average daily transactions? So there is the question mark over, over how effective intervention can be. And perhaps the introduction of the euro, euro back in 1999 killed off central bank intervention across Western Europe because – you, you, you've ultimately not got um, uh, any consensus around where the exchange rate ought to be in any case. So does that, so just thinking about policy tools, does that really just, particularly in, in, in Western Europe, does that just leave monetary policy in, in the sort of purest form as interest rate management? And it, it, asset purchases it, yeah it does i mean asset purchases are a relatively new thing as well i mean not for you guys uh, as much as me but asset purchases didn't exist until 2008 you'd never you'd never seen that happen before you'd seen a lot of fiscal intervention by governments but you'd never seen the asset purchases from uh, from central banks previously uh, you know i mean this is as close to helicopter money as um, as we've gotten uh, as far as central banks are concerned. Um, I, I mean, let, let's be clear as well. If you are intervening via interest rates or asset purchases to try and affect currency valuations, you're probably not going to be successful either. I mean, again, going back to the ERM crisis of, of 92, 93, the, the Swedish central bank, the Riksbank, tried this and it didn't work. You know, they raised their overnight rate to over 500%. And it staved off their currency crisis for a few months, but they still left in November of that year. They were still out. Okay, you know, the UK was out a couple of months early, but they were still out. James, do you know what I mean? Yeah. The, the effectiveness of all these policies comes into the kind of, again, the idiosyncratic natures of each of these economies. If you think about the import export dynamic, a higher or lower exchange rate will in fact that dependent on what the country is importing and exporting. Same with, if you think back to your points about uh, interest rates um, and asset purchases, which are a relatively new phenomenon. Uh, in Europe, fiscal policy uh, largely became a little bit a thing of the past, or at least a little bit more muted, given the, the kind of measures that they were put under due to the consolidation into one block and therefore asset purchases became a lot more prevalent. I think it's also worth pointing out that it depends on the, the crisis, for want of a better phrase, or, or the thing that you're trying to mitigate. I guess the question that I'm posing here is what would central bank intervention be the tool to help or, or mitigate? Would it be 
the import export dynamic or would it be something else i i don't think that it is it is that i mean i think again um you know you you've got the risk of competitive devaluations within that um if it, if it's seen to be effective then why wouldn't another economy try the same trick and then you end up being back where you started um I, I think interventions are, uh, and central bank management nowadays is much more uh, around trying to, uh, from a micro perspective, affect lending, affect you know the, the things that they believe they're actually in control of, and not affect, uh, not trying to affect foreign exchange rates materially or trying to affect the import export dynamic i think that's left to its own devices to to a degree um, because it's just too hard to um to actually determine whether it was successful or not um in the round and i think going back to the the the, the point around um as the asset purchase programs i think one of the things we did see in the beginning was this competitive round of asset purchase inflation so to speak that, that, that they'd keep coming in and saying well we're going to do more asset purchases and the currency would be affected by that for a while and then the, the the next central bank would come in and the next central bank would come in and we'd be back where we started before you know sort of three six months were out Dunk. I, I was just um i think from from the things that we've said uh, earlier i think that it seems it seems unlikely from what you said that there will be further currencies that will come under under sort of specific or explicit management and okay thinking from the from the corporate point of view whether you're purchasing regular a particular currency or whether you're um, whether you're whether you're selling that it's i think corporates corporates love to have certainty or to have some predictability so whether you're buying a, a currency that's managed and, and stays within a band and you can think well that's that's good because i can forecast for uh, with a with a relative degree of certainty that relationship will still hold if the relationship does not maintain um like like for say the swiss franc at, at a period of time then then the, the game has changed completely and then that's that that can reflect in materially higher costs or um or or, or you know increased margins if you're on, on the right side of the move um, but I think it's safe to say if you're not on the, um, not within a mar- managed or a very free floating currency, that'd probably be the same the same relationship, and it, it can go in either direction for a long time. I, I mean, I th- I think the, the the other sort of question mark here. We we've talked about the Swiss National Bank and ending that peg, and the damage that it did credibility wise, but it also did a lot of material, real economic damage as well. There are other currencies out there that are picked. There are other currencies out there that, that therefore carry an inherent risk to them. We don't know which way pegs might break. Um, but if you look at a lot of Middle Eastern currencies at the moment, who they're, they're still heavily wedded to the, the, the energy industry, even though they've made attempts to diversify. If you look at the Hong Kong dollar peg and the link between Hong Kong and the finance sector, um, uh, you look at the the, the Euro Danish peg. You know there are there are currencies that are pegged at the moment that you you would have to question the long term sustainability of that. You you know, and as I say, I don't know which way the pegs would break or wh- when that 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 might come under sort of pressure. But I do think that this is an ongoing question that businesses and and particularly i think on on the fi side of things you know this is you know there's the ongoing round of when is you know when are these gonna not not if they're gonna gonna break but when and in which direction james do you want to come back on that yeah it's it's a very interesting uh, discussion that comes around uh, at opportune moments at, at certain parts of the year especially in relation to say hong kong or or, or, or the Saudi peg. Those are the two large ones that often get discussed. And it's normally something along the lines of questions uh, uh, about the, the state and, and the level of oil that bring into question whether the Saudi peg is potentially long-term manageable. And then people start analysing on the institutional side, 
the the size of reserves and how long it is it is possible to keep something at a certain level. On on the Hong Kong side, similar similar debates um, have been made whether Hong Kong converges with the renminbi peg or whether it trades to the top side uh, with a stronger dollar and those tend to come around when you see liquidity or um, front-end interest rate squeezes and um, either way institutional investors look at these from a perspective of um, these are understandably low vol currency pairs um, you can get a fair amount of leverage on on um, transactions and and they're they're interesting to look at. Um, I, th- I think there are, there are many that look at the uh, look at the history of um, of Soros in the past and and what happened in the UK and think that could be them. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, I think you know there were specific economic fundamental conditions with regard to the ERM that made a breaking of the ERM not just with the UK, but also with a number of other currencies, inevitable. Um, I don't think I see the same thing in a lot of these other, I mean, with with, with, with the exception, of course, of Euro-Danish, because the Euro-Danish peg is uh, a legacy of the, the ERM. Um, but, but I do think with, with some of the others, I think there is a, a, a wish that these pegs will break rather than them looking specifically at what the fundamental drivers for breaking of those pegs might be. Uh, and and I think that's the, that there is a, that fundamental difference there is that if you look at the Hong Kong dollar, you look at the Saudi at the moment, what's going to prompt a material shift in, in, in those pegs? And I can't see anything, at least not in the sort of short to medium term horizon, I'm setting myself up for a big fall here if one of them were to go now. But um, but I can't so, see anything in the so short, good. medium term horizon that, that actually changes those relationships. Unlike, you know, the, 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 the Swiss peg, in hindsight, there were warning, you know, flashing amber warning signals over that in terms of the buildup of, of FX reserves and the problems that that was creating with regard to persistent deflation. That's not evident in these other pegs. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, you know, that um, don't worry, this is a podcast and whatever short to medium term is, it can be it can be any time. So <laughs> you're OK. Um, yeah, with, I don't, I don't think so. Beer. I think I've I think I've used you short and medium term too often in, in these podcasts. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure somebody's going to say, yeah, but you meant different in, the, in that one to this one. If, uh, if I'm trying to get away with that. But no, I mean, I think. I, I do think going back to sort of FX intervention, I think, you know, with these sort of peg currencies, I don't think that you'd see them again standing in the way if, if there were to be a material macroeconomic shift that required the pegs to break. I don't think you'd see the, the, the monetary authority standing in the way of that. I think they, that they would accept the, the SMB's sort of um, uh, failures, uh, try, and ma- try and manage it, try and talk it better um than the smb managed um but i don't think they're gonna that, that they're gonna stand in the way of it because i think it's just it's just go, going back to your initial comment dunks it's catching a falling knife and that's only going to end badly yeah james do you want to come back i i, I want i think one thing that we haven't discussed yet is um and a kind of to pose a question what about europe i mean europe is a, an amalgamation of many different states with a lot of different um economic situations and um it is again discussed when you have crises in italy greece um whether you have nations dropping out or whether you have um a, a stronger block led by potentially germany france uh peeling off that would clearly be in in some situations seen as a um, a peg break, break, which would then need central bank intervention. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I mean, I think the the UK media is uh, almost obsessed with when is the euro going to break up, and and to to an extent, the the financial markets based in London or the financial businesses based in London have a, have a, a similar obsession. I, I, I mean, in the highly unlikely event. Get, I'll get that caveat in first. The highly unlikely event that the euro block was to to, to split off, um, you would anticipate it would split off, but potentially make the euro stronger in terms of shedding weaker economies. Um, 
Uh, and, but clearly, that would be a suboptimal outturn for those that remained within the euro. Um, and I'm thinking of particularly here, Germany and a lot of the, northern, uh, the other northern European economies. That would actually make them less um, uh, uh, less competitive. So I can I, I can kind of see like the, the 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 argument for it, but actually the the, the, the risk in all of this that it is that it it turns out to be a disaster for. Um, and for those countries that remain. Going back to your point, James, that you were talking about, you know, when would you intervene in, in currencies? You'd intervene, or you'd possibly consider because your importer exporter dynamic changes, you know. Um, and, uh, and of course, it is easier to try and intervene to weaken a currency rather than strengthen it. Um, but how much would you have to increase your stockpile of foreign exchange reserves? How many additional dollars or yen or, you know, uh, potentially um, Chinese renminbi or other currencies? How much of that would you have to buy to make that material difference? And 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 how much damage would that then wreak because of the reduction in money supply that it would create? Well, we're ending. We're ending on a positive note there. Aren't yeah, we? yeah. Uh, <laughs> How much do you have to destroy your economy by to uh, to weaken your currency? Well, I, yeah, I think, and I think, I think that that is a fantastic place to to draw, draw this discussion to a close. Uh, once again, thank you everyone for listening, and um, we will be releasing yet another topic sometime soon. Thank you. Bye.